Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a real joy to have you back at the university for our new series of inaugural lectures. Um, COVID has put many spanners in the works, and we've not had a, an inaugural lecture for the last 18 months. And this has meant that uh, many of the promotions had to be delayed, promotion committees sat, and the great news I should acknowledge the Provost Chancellor here, just notice you behind your mask, Canon Wynn. Um, this has meant that several of our colleagues who waited to apply did apply, and the good news is that we have 12 new professors of the university, and there's a series of 12 inaugural lectures from this November to next November. And that's a great celebration of a rich crop of fine scholars, many of them with personal chairs having grown up at the system and competed with scholars from anywhere else. So we are really, we have much to celebrate and I hope our professors have to jump through many loops to become full professors. But we do also stop at this time to celebrate each one of them in a special way because to be a professor at the university is probably to reach the zenith of one's academic career. And I'm especially delighted that the first of the series of 12 is a greatly loved colleague who was here when I came, some 18 months, 18 years ago now, Peter. And Professor McGrail was appointed then to the Department of Theology and has since grown with the institution, with the department, and has served this university um, for many, many years. And what a joy it is to have in the series of 12 a theologian and to meet in our Senate room, which is still sacred space, one of our chapels, but it's also where the university makes its most important academic decisions here in this sacred space. And we gather here again tonight to celebrate the chair that Professor Peter McGrail has been, has been appointed to. You'll hear more about him just now from the uh, Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor, but may I also, in welcoming you all this evening, make a special mention of Professor McGrail's mother and family with us. Now that's a very, very special thing to have, to have one's parents and to have one's family with one. So very, very welcome. We're delighted to have you. And I'm going to invite now the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Atulia Naga, to introduce our speaker, Professor Naga. Colleagues, uh, distinguished guests, friends, and family of Professor McGrail, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity this evening to introduce our new professor, and hence the inaugural lecturer, Professor Peter McGrail. Professor McGrail is the most recent addition, as the Vice Chancellor mentions, to the Hope's Professoriate, a body of distinguished academics that the university has spent a great deal of time building up over the past several years. Here at HOPE, we pride ourselves in a curriculum that is research-informed and researcher-delivered. The university's core strengths are in the humanities-shaped and liberal arts-inspired curriculum. Professor McGrail, who has been given a personal chair as professor of liturgical theology for his sustained and distinguished academic career and research excellence is a good example of our university's rich humanities tradition as can be seen from Professor McGrail's academic credentials and research profile. Professor McGrail graduated with a music degree from the University of Liverpool in 1980 he then went to the Venerable English College in Rome from 1980 to 1987, where he studied philosophy and theology at the Gregorian University and then transferred to the Pontifical Liturgical Institute for postgraduate studies, leading to a licentiate in sacred liturgy. He was ordained as a priest of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Liverpool 
1985 and has worked in a variety of parish settings. He has over 35 years of experience as a priest of the Liverpool Roman Catholic Archdiocese. He is a long-standing member of the liturgy committee of the English Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales, and he chairs its liturgical formation subcommittee. He has also served as Roman Catholic observer to the Liturgy Commission of the Church of England. Professor McGrail joined Liverpool Hope in 2003, the year he received his doctoral qualification from the University of Birmingham, and his PhD thesis was on the Roman Catholic ritual of First Holy Communion. Professor McGrail has led theology, philosophy, and religious studies at this university since 2013. He is currently interim head of the School of Humanities, and his research broadly focuses on the Roman Catholic community in this country. Professor McGrail has edited and co-edited several volumes and is indeed very well published. Two of his monographs published by Ashgate Press are particularly noteworthy the 2013 monograph entitled The Right of Christian Initiation, Adult Rituals, and Roman Catholic Ecclesiology. And before that, in 2007, his monograph entitled The First Communion, Ritual, Church, and Popular Religious Identity. Whilst his uh, earlier published work has related to issues such as the Roman Catholic ritual, of First Holy Communion, university chaplaincy, and the impact at classroom level of the 2016 revision of the GCSE and A-level RE or religious education program. Uh, more recently, he has been closely engaged in gathering and analyzing data for the listening phase of the Synod process of the Archdiocese of Liverpool. And I understand that the subject of uh, his inaugural lecture tonight is on that. He is currently working on groundbreaking and interdisciplinary research into diaconal and lay ministry in the archdiocese, and his research draws upon socio-scientific, theological, geographical, as well as analytical methodologies. And indeed, he has been involved and has delivered several consultancy projects over the last 10 years or so. And so, it is a genuine delight and joy for me to invite Professor McGrail to deliver to us his inaugural lecture entitled, Living Under the Shadow of a Lonely and Sacramentally Starved Old Age? Question mark, liturgical Realities and Opportunities in the Archdiocese of Liverpool. Professor McGrail. Thank you for Professor Nagar. Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Chancellor, colleagues, friends, and dear members of my family, permit me to begin with a nod towards one of our university's founding fathers, Archbishop Derek, Derek Warlock. This man who ordained me a priest 36 years ago is on record for a couple of swipes he took at people just like me, that is, at academics, who study the pattern of rituals, words, gestures, and symbolic actions that together constitute the liturgy or the worship of the church. Our collective noun is liturgists. At least that's the polite one. In his personal diary of the Second Vatican Council, Warlock disparagingly described the group of liturgists that drafted the council's landmark constitution on the sacred liturgy as quote, a rather self-conscious commission. Just a little irony there, do you think? <laughs> he took evident pleasure in quoting delicious stories, as he put it, against them. Many of them, he said, had made their names through writing about liturgical eccentricities. And the nicest story of all 
he wrote, was of Pope John XXIII's visit to the final meeting of the commission. The experts and pundits were gathered, Warlock wrote, expecting some particularly profound liturgical homily. However, John XXIII decided that the whole business was being taken too seriously, and so he trotted out the old chestnut about the shipwreck, where each passenger was told he must throw some possession overboard to save the ship from sinking. According to the Pope, the captain threw out his wife, and the chaplain threw overboard his breviary, that is, his liturgical prayer book. Altogether, Warlock concluded, a nice finish for a liturgical commission. Let us call out the sexist undercurrent of the reported papal joke, and note that its Sitzim Laban was an entirely male audience. Such are the subtle but accumulative building blocks of institutionalized misogyny, even, or perhaps especially, when attributed to a canonized saint of the church. Now, Warlock would have justifiably defended himself against a charge of at least conscious misogyny, but there is no disguising the evident delight he took in the Pope's jibe against my own profession. An early diary entry expresses his initial admiration for Cardinal Ottaviani, de facto leader of the conservative faction at the council. Ottaviani took to the podium of Vatican II in early October 1962 to criticize roundly the draft constitution on the liturgy. He argued that its contents were the product of the exaggerated ambitions of liturgists who had foolishly invaded the field of dogmatic theology. Given Derek's taste for delicious stories about liturgists and their eccentricities, I can quite imagine that quip raising a classic warlock demi-smile. However, Derek was not in complete control of his facts. The papal visit to the commission took place on the 15th of April, 1961, and the final meeting of the commission was only held on the 13th of January, 1962. So this wasn't the commission's nice finish at all. The minutes of the commission record the visit, but blandly report that the Pope thanked everybody for the work they had put into preparing the council. Perhaps the minute keeper discreetly censored an unwelcomed jibe, and Derek would have been in no position to blame him. There are those present who can testify to his capacity for drafting minutes before a meeting had even taken place. Derek of course, shifted his position on the council and went on to be a fervent champion of its far-reaching teachings, especially with regard to the role and the apostolate of the laity. Even so, I can't imagine that he would have been terribly impressed by my new title of Professor of Liturgical Theology. Warlock was Archbishop of Liverpool during years of social and economic decay when the government was urged by its senior members to leave these cities to, quote, a managed decline. The warlock years were years of the lingering specter of sectarian division in the city and nights of rioting on the streets of Toxteth. If there were to be such a thing as the Derek Warlock chair at Liverpool Hope, it could conceivably have been a chair of Catholic social teaching or of ecumenical theology, but probably not of liturgy. Such a chair as mine might, if anything, appear even less relevant today. Whatever the enduring effect of the GAP26 conference will prove to be, it has nonetheless reminded the world that climate issues and the economic forces that power our world are inextricably linked to questions of human flourishing. Ordinary people, including, I am pleased to say, members of our own university, traveled to Glasgow to highlight the systemic inequality, oppression, and exploitative abuse that lurk within our world system, 
and that mitigate against resolving the climate crisis. And meanwhile, since Warlock's time, the Roman Catholic Church has taken its own place alongside other institutions that have historically prior prioritized the defense of public image above resounding openly and appropriately to the abuse of vulnerable people entrusted to their care. The church today is repeatedly wrong-footed in broader debates and in trends in society. And those of us who have the privilege of working with young people encounter the misstep between church and society on an almost daily basis. When it comes to questions such as the rights of women or of the experience of the LGBTQ plus community, many of our students look at the church with bemusement, sometimes bordering on contempt. But yet, when the church attempts to respond by drawing on the wisdom it has gained from its long experience of human life and nature, the impact of its internal contradictions readily results in, a, in an accusation of hypocrisy. Now, should not those be the issues on which we focus our professional gaze or professorial gaze here at Hope? Surely, now is not the time to be raising to prominence a discipline so ephemeral as the study of Christian worship, especially when over the past decade much debate within Roman Catholicism on the subject has frequently resulted in venomous introspection. However, I unambiguously align myself with those self-conscious experts and bishops of Vatican II, because their perspective on the liturgy extended far beyond systems of prescribed ritual activity. Nor do I imagine that they were speaking, and I quote Ottaviani directly, ex exaggeratione liturgistiarum, when they gave the liturgy a central role in their vision of the church, a central role in their vision of its life and of its ministry. I just think that academic engagement with the principle and also, sadly, much social media debate all too often starts from the wrong place. Too frequently, that is, with the textual history, ritual analysis, and close discussion of the celebratory aesthetics of the individual act of worship. That focus can quickly indeed lead to liturgical eccentricities, delicious as they may be. To narrow our focus to these things alone is to forget a key insight of Vatican II. The Council described the liturgy and especially the celebration of the Eucharist as simultaneously the summit towards which the activity of the church is directed and the source from which all her power flows, the font and apex of the whole Christian life. The terms summit, apex, fount, source imply an essential dynamism a cyclical pattern of motion inwards and a corresponding motion of return. The worship of the church is not a comforting sanctuary from the grimmer and grimier dimensions of human existence. Instead, the reality of the world beyond the church doors is positively intended to break into the liturgy, welcome or not, and the liturgy in turn, drives its worshippers out into the fullest possible engagement with humanity. To illustrate, at least on a theoretical level, the potential of this model, let's stay for the moment with COP26 and the environment. In traditions such as the Roman Catholic, Anglican, Byzantine, the eruption of the world into the liturgy is accentuated by an exuberant use of stuff that comes from the material with world. The encounter with the divine is mediated through the handling of precious metals, of fine woods, and the products of artistic craftsmanship, with wine, bread and oil, fire and light, color 
and perfume with water in abundance. Yet these same substances also have the potential to mediate an encounter with a disfigured earth, scraped hollow of its resources, of its precious metals, with systemic deforestation, and with production lines compromised by greed and by global systems of economic exploitation. These same objects central to our worship can evoke the people massing on the forested borderlands of the EU in search of safety, sustenance, and livelihood, and therefore also the trade routes in people that crisscross our content, continent and the many, mile, many millions throughout the world who lack access to clean drinking water. I am, of course, channeling my inner Pope Francis now. But let's be brutally honest about the symbols we use in worship. They're ambiguous. So let us own the power of their ambiguous nature and open our ears to hear the truths that they convey and all too easily scream out. But the source, summit, apex, fount process must be two-way in order to be effective. If the intrusion of the world into Christian liturgy is not an accident, but is in fact is encoded into the DNA of the liturgy itself, then the liturgy becomes a point of dynamic confrontation between the Christian message and the realities of life. It is above all a place where the fracture lines between the two become evident, and it is in the liturgy that the Christian response is shaped. To cast a light on those fracture lines is a key function of the proclamation of the Scriptures in worship. For example, today's gospel in both Roman Catholic and Anglican traditions is a parable about the use and misuse of money by those in high office. Please don't tell me that doesn't speak to goings on this afternoon in Parliament. And then, the sacramental engagement with the core message of Christianity in the Eucharist focuses and drives home the action. The ancient Latin conclusion to the Roman Catholic Eucharist is ite missa est, and it perfectly summarizes the challenge. Okay, okay, liturgical eccentricities, what exactly missa est means, nobody is entirely certain, and there are endless volumes written on it. But one thing is unambiguous, ite, comic Roman imperative, I translate it as get out. That at least is the theory. However, over 20 years of studying the Roman Catholic community have convinced me that the picture is far more complex. And the relationship between the worshipping community and the world beyond it is rather more fragile than a simple reading of the summit and fount paradigm appears to suggest. Now, as far as theories go, this one is pretty well perfect, yet it is church talk and it needs to be earthed in realities on the ground if we've got any hope of making sense of it, let alone making it the cornerstone in practice of worship. Therefore, I suggest that the correct places to start our discussion of the role of the liturgy in the life of the Archdiocese of Liverpool are the often fragile and sometimes contested points of intersection between the worshipping community and those realities of environment, justice, and of human flourishing. Investigating these has been my approach to date, and I aim it to continue to be a hallmark of my professorship here. In relating and in researching the liturgy, I seek out the ambiguous space that is the threshold between the worshipping community and the world. Unlike all threshold or liminal spaces, this is frequently one of tension and misunderstanding, conflict and insecurity. And yet, again, like all liminal spaces, it can also be marked by creativity, outreach, and by genuine compassion, which are sometimes remarkably invisible in the church's life of worship. 
and discourses about it. When an empirical research approach is taken to the study of the liturgy, then the inward-outward dynamism of summit and fount is revealed to be rather more tenuously drawn than the council appears to have envisaged. In many parts of the archdiocese, it is not a confident Catholic community that looks out from the liturgical assembly through the doors of the church to a world beyond with a sense of mission and purpose and outreach to that world. Its members do not gaze from a place of security out across a threshold. Many of those who attend regularly and worship experience a degree of liminality about their own relationship with the church, with their own relationship with their liturgical life. And nor should we imagine that the clergy represent a point of secure stability in the midst of so much flux. They are, we are, human beings. They too, alongside the people they serve, may well be discovering and negotiating their own identities, their ecclesial identity, their human identity, and not infrequently their sexual identities. They too are moving in different directions with their relationship to the church and with society. They too are seeking to understand their own aging, at least I am, and their life of faith. They too are asking, you too are asking, how to make sense of a life dedicated, at least in cold human terms, to a declining and increasingly marginalized and derided institution. What for the church-going population, what for the clergy constitutes human flourishing? Their needs and their relationship with the whole ecclesial setup are complex too. So this threshold between the worshiping community and the world is not located at the door of the church. It seeps inwards through the church doors and into the lives of worshippers and it runs across their relationships with others and not least with members of their own families. It is there you will often see the fracture lines most clearly drawn. And clearly, therefore, the encounter with the world outside the church is emotionally charged, not least because it catalyzes questions of personal and communi commun communal identity, of disempowerment and of family concerns. It is a fluid hinterland rather than a clearly defined border that extends between the congregation assembled in church and the world beyond their doors. And that experience triggers for many Catholics a sense of existential crisis about the continuity, the validity and the meaning of the system that hitherto has formed the framework for their lives as Catholics an existential crisis that was summarily expressed in the quotation found in the title of this lecture, I fear I face a lonely, sacramentally starved old age. Introspection, rather than a dynamic missional orientation, frequently dominates liturgical discussion. The scale and the potential of, um, of that hinterland of ambiguous liminality is starkly exposed by a three-year process of reflection and discernment that the Archdiocese has recently carried out under the banner of an Archdiocesan Synod, and I'm glad to welcome the Synod moderators to us here. A Roman Catholic Synod dif differs from the synodal system of the Church of England in that it has a purely consultative rather than a legislative function. But that said, the Synod is increasingly recognized, and not least by Pope Francis, as an instrument to bring the voice of the broader Church to the fore, to hear what life is like on the ground. So between January and June 2019, the Archdiocese of Liverpool sought to garner the opinions of people across the Archdiocese in preparation for a synod it was due to hold in 2020. Facilitated conversations across the Archdiocese engaged a broad constituency, ranging from general parish meetings 
to parents of children engaged with sacramental preparation programs, to school governors and small social groups. Listening also took place in Catholic primary and secondary schools across the archdiocese using simplified versions of the questions that the diocese had prepared. And then again with young people during the annual archdiocesan pilgrimage to Lourdes. A total of 621 records of such meetings, with some individual responses included, were generated. Literally tens of thousands of people were in one way or another touched by this pre-synodal consultation. And once the Archdiocese had gathered those responses um, and collated them, it delivered them here to hope, where my role was to lead the analysis of the findings. I was assisted in this task by Dr. Michael Miller, whose post as my research was research assistant was funded by the Archdiocese. Alongside the Archdiocesan listening exercise, Dr. Miller and I ran two further strands of research inquiry. Because these lay entirely within our remit, we were able to apply robust protocols, including rigorous ethical procedures, the collection of anonymized data regarding age group, gender, broad geographical location, etc., which facilitated a more complex analysis of the data. The first of our two strands was an online survey of adults aged 18 years or older, which was open from the 28th of January to the 30th of June 2019. This survey yielded 1,182 analyzing and un analyzable responses, most of which were very detailed and highly personal. The second strand comprised 10 focus groups, each of about 10 people. And these groups included priests, deacons and their wives, recent arrivals in the country, members of the LGBTQ plus community, and Catholics who preferred the celebration of the Roman rituals in their pre-Vatican II form. I'd suggest, therefore, that the entire process was a close collaboration between the archdiocese and the university. And without for a minute diminishing the importance of traditional research in the humanities, I'd like to suggest that such close collaboration with external partners has to be a viable model going forward across the university, especially in a present climate which regards the humanities increasingly as a rather optional extra. In September 2019, Dr. Miller and I produced a lengthy report of our findings across all strands of inquiry, which are still available on the Archdiocesan website. I then presented the key findings to the 400 Syndic delegates in September 2019, and a video of the event was also posted on the Archdiocesan website in order to reach as wide a possible as audience as we could. And the analysis that Dr. Miller and I did then informed further Archdiocesan consultations and discussions that led directly into the Synod, which took place earlier this year, and from thence into the Archdiocesan Plan, which is one week away from its formal publication and constitutes its strategic vision for the coming years. Now, I trust by now, hope colleagues are beginning to glimpse the broad outlines of an impacts narrative for the next ref starting to emerge. Not surprisingly, the listening exercised produced rich data on the liturgy, and it's that that forms the basis for the rest of this lecture. I think it is important that we begin by noting the real importance that many respondents gave to the celebration of the liturgy. This was not, for anyone who responded, a casual side event in their lives. For many, it summed up and it expressed their entire Catholic identity. So I just want to start with responses from three men, three different ages, three different places in the church, which encapsulate the significance of this for them and which really take us into a lot of the way it takes forward. A guy in his 30s said, there have been moments of hope whilst in church when I have been empowered to face the week ahead, often with the intention of being more truthful caring 
and forgiving. However, I frequently fail to live up to these intentions. Sunday Mass gives me the opportunity to pause and reflect on my thoughts and actions. From a member of the traditional Catholics focus group who prefer the celebration of the rituals according to their pre-Vatican II form. It's kind of like a rock, isn't it? Well, against, well, it's like chaos outside when you think about it. And for me, the Mass, it's like kind of a rock where it holds it together. So you might be facing employment or uncertainties in work, difficulties at home, but if you've got that rock, you have got something to cling to. This is not a casual event in the lives of these people. And a priest. It sounds incredibly pious to say this, but it's the place where I get joy. The Mass for me as a Christian, as a Catholic Christian, and as a priest, is the center of what keeps me sane, engaged. It's truly where I find my joy, hope, and motivation for what I do. I think we're try, invited to try to center our lives on the Mass. And I think if we do, then that's where we will actually find what we're looking for. I don't necessarily think there has to be any particular way that it's celebrated that makes it more or less meaningful people. I think we have a broad range of perspectives. The wonderful thing about being a Catholic for me is that whatever way you celebrate the Mass, we're celebrating Mass, and we share that in common. It's the center what we do. For generations, the celebration of Mass stands at the heart of Catholic pra practice and identity. I learned that from my mother, she learned that from her mother, and she learned that from my great-grandmother and beyond. So it's not surprising to see these comments arising out of the listening. But there were also voices of anxiety and concern, and these take us to the fracture lines, and so I, being me, go straight for them. And for this lecture, I divide those voices of anxiety into three categories. Firstly, concerns about the numerical divide, decline of the mass going community. Secondly, liturgical conflict within that community, and third, issues of inclusion and exclusion. When Archbishop McMahon first announced to the Archdiocese his intention to hold a synod, and this was in October 2018, he set out some stark statistics. In 1962, there were 264,000 people at Mass each Sunday in this archdiocese. A quarter of a million people attended Mass on a Sunday in Liverpool Archdiocese. Last year, 2017, that number had fallen to 47,000. In 1962, there were over 400 priests serving the archdiocese, and now there are just 120. I can see Reverend Dr. Christopher Fallon sitting over there, and this data has been analyzed by him in great depth. He's also a member of our governing council. Chris not only unpicks the complexities of calculating any science of the Roman Catholic population size and the mass going percentage, the maths are fascinating, Chris. I just wish I understood them. But he also highlights the worrying age distribution of the active clergy in 2020. When, at that stage, he conducted his research, only 13 of the active clergy were below the age of 40. Um, over supper, you can update us on that grim figure. Even allowing for some variation in the calculation of the numerical size of the Catholic population here in Liverpool, it is impossible to escape both the radical diminution in the number of those regularly attending mass and the shrinking body of active clergy. And these twin trends were strongly reflected in the listening data drawn from the Synod. The motif of fear and loneliness that I gave in the title comes from that listening. 
And we hear it again in the responses of several other respondents. I worry that as a consequence of fewer priests and fewer parishes and parishioners, that it will not be able to benefit from having a community of faith around me to support and challenge me. If I enter the end part of my life, oh sorry, as I enter the end part of my life and with no family, will I be able to answer God's call to use the wisdom I have been taught? Will my church be there for me and for others who are alone and have needs, emotional, personal, and physical? Two people also asked, is there going to be a priest to bury me? Many of the responses that were received seek to place the blame at the door of different constituencies in the church. It's the bishops. It's those liberal clergy. It's the conservative clergy. It's young people. It's Catholic schools. Nobody mercifully mentioned hope. What certainly comes to the fore from all that is a strong sense that the issue is not simply a decline in the number of vocations. Two respondents really captured this with uh, particular clarity. I am almost in despair at the state of our church, as I do not think the people with power in the church really understand what is causing us to lose so many of our young people. To younger people, the church looks dominated by male clerics, misogynistic, secretive, unable to run its affairs in an efficient manner, and unable to project how our faith relates to today's world. However, I recognize there are many good people in the church living out their faith, and we do a great amount of good. Unfortunately, our current public profile is appalling. We do not need to change our faith, but how we, need, we need to change how we teach it and how we conduct the life of the church. And if you think that was bad, as an organization, the church is broken, and lost all meaningful credibility. Once those aged over 60 to 70 have gone, it is difficult to see how churches will be filled. They're not filled anyway. At least half will need to be closed down. We keep on hearing how we should attract younger people, but even older people like myself feel further away from the church than at any other time in our life. As Pope Francis says, the church needs to follow the gospel more instead of trying to cover up its own inadequacies. We keep on hearing about the shortage of priests, but the percentage of mass attendance has fallen well below that of priests. But the fact remains that it is the accelerating profile, the accelerating impact, sorry, of the age profile of the active clergy that impacts most directly on the spiritual and liturgical experience of lay Catholics. Looking to the future, one respondent asked, will I get to fulfill my daily norms of piety? Will I get a daily mass? Will I be able to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, even if it is through a locked door? And a sense of concern for the future spiritual life of respondents' children and grandchildren fed repeatedly into the focus on this issue. My main concern, one wrote, is that with the lack of priests, my church could be closed. Thus, denying the community experience to my children and grandchildren. So in mapping the geography of the liminal space between liturgy and world, we need to factor in the possibility that that, um, that limen, that place of confusion, extends beyond any point of resolution. That in purely physical terms, many Catholics simply find it increasingly difficult to conceive of a point of arrival beyond the threshold. No church in which to celebrate, no priest to minister, no congregation. This sense of a fractured landscape is reinforced by the fact that the liturgy itself emerges from the data as a disputed terrain. At least, at the least combative, sorry, at the least combative pole of dispute, several respondents told of their dis disillusion with liturgical celebrations they had attended. Ladies and gentlemen of the clergy, hold on to your seats. As a divorced single parent, I find more joy and hope in everyday life than in the experiences of liturgy or in services where there appears to be performance and faff 
rather than the meeting of community. Or, often for me, Mass feels perfunctory and seems perfunctory for the celebrant. We all know the prayers off by heart. We say them almost by rote. The bidding prayers, too, seem detached and a box-ticking exercise. When there's a celebration that comes off script, so to speak, and feels heartfelt, that's when it's joyful and meaningful for me. And the celebratory style of the ministers itself was directly criticised. The synod should discuss the solemnity of the mass from a gen should, re should discuss recovering rather the solemnity of the mass from a generation of priests who seem to lack faith and whose main offerings are entertainment and social commentary. Priests in general seem to think that mass is a joke and it's all about them being funny or popular. People hate it. They just want mass celebrated in a respectful way. Meanwhile, the priests themselves were acutely sensitive to criticism that was being leveled against them during the whole course of the synod process. One focus group respondent said of the process while it was midway through, what I'm hearing is that a lot of it is against the priest. It's always against the men in black. One of my brother clergy picked this up as a theme on his personal blog site. And he listed reasons why, as a man in black, he did not feel particularly powerful. That's the picture he used as well. The bishop might use us. The bishop might not move us. The diocesan structures control how we run our parishes. The laity won't assist us in running the parishes. The laity are too bossy trying to run the parishes. There are ever-increasing technical demands on our time. School inspections, building, electrical, asbestos, fire regulation inspections. The bank account has 19 other signatories at the curial offices on it. Running more than one parish at a time is exhausting. Doing funerals every week for mainly lapsed Catholics is taking up my time. I'm depressed at the numbers attending. What will happen in the future? There, Philip, I have channeled our inner Simon Henry. Depending on their ideological standpoint, respondents offered very different perspectives on how to attract more people to attend Mass. For some, what was actually required was a reinstatement of traditional forms of worship, with which I suspect that blog author would not have been um, too opposed. We should recover and educate in our Catholic heritage, most particularly in music, but in art and architecture as well, as powerful instruments of supporting the faith and conversion. Will mass be restored to its former glory? Head covering in church, for women that is. Stop turning back on God, especially when handshaking. Yet, on the other side, Others suggested taking the celebration of the liturgy in a completely opposite direction. Get rid of the Latin. People sing or say it, but don't understand it. Look at ways to make the celebration of Mass more vibrant and engaging to a modern congregation. Music, technology. I suspect they'd been to Hillsong. Why do we all face away from each other and be preached at? Put tables around, have meals to share the faith we have. Be more relaxed, interact, ask friends to come, share food, discuss openly the gospel of the day. I think they have been looking at messy church. Several respondents, of course, urged a via media, asking, for example, where do we find the balance between progress and tradition? Pope Francis has recently intervened in the whole question of the use of pre-Vatican II liturgical reforms. However, in the face of a crisis as existential as the continuity of the Catholic community, in a form that at least bears some resemblance to what has been the norm up till now, I consider it very unlikely that some current positions on the liturgy are going to soften any time soon. Indeed, softening is not what I foresee. There is a real risk 
that in a liminal situation, the tendency might be for the boundaries of the community to be more tightly drawn, more restrictive, more just to people like us. And as the liturgical assembly is the most visible manifestation of that community, such redrawing is likely to be particularly felt there. One mother spoke of her anxieties for her children should they fall foul of any such response in the future. I am worried that my children may not be able to stay and receive communion because they are not the right people, either because they are gay or divorced and remarried. Parents of divorced and remarried adult children were particularly vocal in expressing their concerns that their children and grandchildren would be excluded from the worshipping life of the community. Members of the LGBTQ community expressed a similar perspective. One gay man related his own experience of exclusion within the Roman Catholic liturgy and of the different welcome he had now received in an Anglican church. Speaking of his experience as a Catholic, he said, I'd even go so far sometimes as to describe it as an abusive relationship, where sometimes you get the impression that actually it's all okay, and that promotes trust. So you take a step in trust, and then you're knocked back again. It's those mixed messages that for me, and partly why I decided to no longer identify a Roman Catholic, and why there is for me one single Anglican parish in Liverpool that is the only place I can feel safe as a gay Christian and safe to be both physically safe, emotionally safe, mentally safe. Everything, right. I can go round as a gay man, participate, minister, whatever, and not only do people not mind, they actually encourage it in a good way. I don't get that sense in other places. I can recognize at least one member of the ministerial team of that particular Anglican parish here with us today. But for the sake of completeness, because we have to be complete, there were also a smaller number of people who felt differently and argued vociferously that the purpose of the Catholic Church was, quote, to show that we have only two genders, male and female, to fight for normal people, heterosexuals. But when it comes to the worshipping community, the most frequent expression of concerns around inclusivity turned on the question of gender, and particularly to the role of women in the church. I like this. What should the, count, what should the synod discuss? The role of women. Surprise, surprise. Women being more involved in the life of the church. I have prayed all my life for the ordination of women deacons and eventually women priests. Women in church leadership, we are not an aberration, but more than 50% of the population. The role of females in the church, I find it completely illogical that we have a huge shortage of effective church leadership, far greater than just a lack of priests, note that, and yet we rule out 50% of the population as having any significant or leading role to play, based completely on gender. My reading of the data is that there were two broadly converging streams of thought represented in the synodal responses on the role of women. One which I think is well represented on this slide is fed by women and some men who have held long held and deeply seated hopes to see a much more significant acknowledgement of the place and giftedness of women in the church. I think that the final quotation on this slide expresses the depth and the breadth of this flow. There is more at stake here than just the ordination of women to the diaconate or priesthood. The greater challenging is the dismantling of a clericalist mindset and structures of church discernment and governments that many women regard as fundamentally engendered to the exclusion of women's voices, experiences, and bodies. These are important questions. They relate to the manner in which, in a Foucauldian sense, power flows through the various institutions and relational intersections of the church. They raise questions of the validation and non-validation of experience, of normativity of bodies, and invite an uncovering of attitudes and worldviews that carry unarticulated presumptions of the normative. 
The second stream is more narrowly focused on the ordination of women, alongside that of married men, as a way of resolving the present crisis in the number of priests. Now, I do not want to close down the discussion of the first stream. If anything, I want to keep it open. But with regard to the ordination of women as a solution to a problem about the shortage of priests, I raise a question, and I ask it equally of men and of women. Why does our focus constantly return towards the ordained priesthood? And why do we see that an increase in their numbers should be regarded as the default solution? I put that alongside the startling fact that of all the responses submitted during the listening phase, only one made direct reference to the baptismal priesthood of the faithful, which is the theological foundation of the mission in the world, and embraces not just a clerical minority, be they male, female, priest, deacon, or bishop, but all Christians. If, as Pope Francis insists, clericalism is an evil in the church, is there not a risk that faced with this crisis, the instinctive response among Catholics is to grasp what are effectively clerical solutions? Faced with all this, the liturgy may appear to be a singularly ill-suited tool to serve as summit and source of the entire life of the church, parche liturgists. That, I suspect, is reflected in the fact that only two responses made during the consultation mentioned it at all. A great deal, yes, was said about the mission of the church, much of it extraordinarily creative and visionary, but links between mission and worship were very thinly drawn indeed. Yet mission is, at its root, a liturgical matter, as also is the repeated focus on the role of the ordained minister. These questions about ministry take us back to the source and fount discussion because it is there where we can find the essential link between liturgy and mission. And it's only when we get liturgy and mission in perspective that the person and the role of the presiding minister can take its proper place. The, the notion of the baptismal or common priesthood of all the faithful lies at the heart of the Second Vatican Council's understanding of mission in the world. The motif of the common priesthood offers an understanding of baptism as an intense identification with Christ and his mission. In this perspective, the baptized Christian, irrespective of gender, age, status, or position, shares profoundly in Christ's mission, shares in his three offices of priest, prophet, and king. In other words, all are consecrated to worship, all are consecrated to service of truth, all are consecrated to service of others. De simply breathing in and out as a Christian, depending on the circumstances, is an exercise of worship, of truth, and of service. Yet this vision, which was revolutionary in its time and which undergirds the entire Vatican II perspective of the Christian life, was alluded to only once during the entire synodal process. I think it's a revolutionary image, and I think its time is now. Can I suggest that the way forward is not to bewail the Lehman, the threshold, that place of ambiguity, but to lean into it and to own its fault lines. The threshold between church and world has probably always run along the aisles of our churches. It's just that now it's much more evident. Stepping onto it, therefore, is not a great leap. It leads the mass going population into familiar territory, into their homes, into the homes and families of their children, their friends, neighbors, and grandchildren. Stepping onto that threshold is about stepping into a world in which the worshippers are already implicated, stepping towards the many people with whom their lives are already interwoven, people whose lives are every bit as messy as their own, people whose lives are as rich in experience as their own. If that step 
onto the threshold is taken in a willingness to serve and in truth, and if it is built on friendship, support, and accompaniment, then we can effectively speak of a worshipping community that steps into mission. And in fact, I suggest to step off the Lehman would be a step away from mission and authenticity. May I also dare to suggest that in deciding where to prioritize its energies, where to deploy its clergy, where to keep its churches open, the archdiocese should be alert, among other things, to those contexts and locations where that threshold, that Lehman, those fracture lines are most keenly experienced, where the fault line between church and the beyond are most evident and keenly felt, because those are the places that might well have the greatest missionary potential. The mass-going community there is already deeply familiar with and enmeshed in the ambiguities of the terrain. But it's also because it is precisely among the ragged edges and the gaps and the rawness of human experience that, as Pope Francis reminds us again and again, Christ can be encountered. Yeah, the prophetic dimension of the common priesthood might sometimes require the kiss Christian to call out injustice, oppression, and bigotry. But the royal dimension is lived out in service rather than power. Shouting the gospel at the world is almost always pointless. But walking alongside others as one just like them is the essence of Christian service and is the essential foundation of evangelization. Yet all that speaking and all that serving are rootless unless they have as their reference point and are sustained by the third dimension of the baptismal priesthood, the life of worship within community. Summit and Fount, that surely is how it all begins to take shape. Thank you. Well, thank you for that absorbing 45 minutes, Professor McGrail. Normally at this time, I'll call someone to move about thanks, normally the Pro Vice Chancellor, and we'll all go out into the darkness again. But uh, this, this time, we're going to innovate a little bit for 10 minutes, not more, to give you a chance to engage with our speaker, and, maybe, and perhaps a question or two. Uh, I'll chair this part before I invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor to move a vote of thanks. So. If you're willing, Professor McGrail, uh, we'll take a, a few questions. Come and stand here and I'll pass, it on, pass the mic on to you. Who's going to be the first? Yes, please, uh, Professor Kelly. Thank you, Stephen. I, I would say hold a synod, actually. Um, but that, that's, what we've, that's, that's what the Archdiocese has done. There's one motif, and I, 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 think, I, I hope I can be forgiven for spilling a bit, bit, few of the beans about the pastoral plan. There's one motif of the pastoral plan of the Archdiocese that's, that's core to it and that has emerged from taking this material, listening to it, digesting it, talking with others about it, and so on. And that has been the motif of accompaniment, that, that it's useless telling people to do anything, it's use, and it's useless setting things up. And what really matters is personal engagement, walking alongside, being with, listening carefully, learning a path of non-judgmental approach, which the churches have not always been terribly good at. 
Um, so uh, I'd say yes. First of all, hold a synod, and then having listened, make a commitment to carry on listening. Um, I think that, that you know the church doesn't have the answers, but it can listen to the people who might, and they're exactly the odds are they're exactly the ones that you who are disillusioned. Thank you. Another question. In synodality. Well, I mean, I think it comes back again. Uh, if I, if I can come back to synodality, not just because we've had one in Liverpool and it's. You know, it's, it's preoccupied us, but because it's a big motif of Pope Francis at the moment. And if I say he sees this as his antidote to clericalism, um, there are certain particularities which the Roman Catholic Church would hold to. One of them is that the Synod is not a democratic process. The Synod is a discerning process. So it doesn't end with a democratic vote. It can recommend, but it can't vote. So you're not with the Church of England uh, General Synod on that front. So that is one very clear point of process. It says, you know, you still stay with the hierarchy. Um, the second is, it sees that there is a very clear role for the ordained priesthood. But this is one point where I think it's not caught up with its own teaching. Because the Second Vatican Council was very clear on this. The ordained priesthood is there at the service of the unfolding of the baptismal priesthood. You know, we, we tend to think of that as the pyramid. Actually, it's probably more like that. That the purpose of those who are ordained is to serve the unfolding of the ministerial priesthood and that that's the real work. The trouble is dignity. And let's name it, we're in a university. We can talk about these things. Power, um, not these gendered power them through the whole thing. So uh, it's, not it's not taken it to being uh, identical with Protestantism. I think it's taking a lot of good lessons and it's doing it in a very Catholic way, which undoubtedly for some people is still going to be a disappointment. Yes. I think the Catholic Church has a choice. It can go for a managed decline if it wants. Uh, and I suspect if it doesn't look at some of the issues that have sort of been raised from the ground, that is the very best you can do. It's quite stark, but it's, it's there, unless it really does. Yet, I um, rejoice in being a Catholic, and a lot of that is for some of the reasons that were listed in the in, in the lecture. I love the sheer material physicality of the Catholic Church. I mean, we're an odd church. We're terribly, terribly upset about bodies a lot of the time. And yet we believe very fervently in the material cosmos and in the role of materiality and in the potential of materiality, and we can't worship without it. Um, we have a real sense, I think, of the human person, even though all too often that leads uh, to abusive situations. It's, it's a real paradox. Um, we've just done, you and I, have delivered a seminar today to level F students 
on the, the basic inhumanity of, 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 of men and women. And we, we were there with Thomas Hobbes. And so all our level F students now know that life is short, brutish, and what have you. But, oh, I'm glad to know. I'm glad to hear it. I, I'm glad to hear it. I often thought I was taking the negative line just to get them talking. But I think you'll find that in the Catholic Church. I still, I'm still happy with it, even though I'm desperately unhappy with it. I still think it has great vision, even though at times it lapses into small things. And I think, you know, I, I really do feel that Vatican II is still a council to be discovered. Yes, Lisa. Makes the shift that you are advocating, the shift to the baptismal ministry. Yes. Yes. Is there another question? We'll probably take one more if there is. Yes, at the back. Um, Ooh. On its fruitless of our status of your church. First of all, I'm really grateful and honored to have a question from uh, Reverend Rod Garner. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I don't know if there's such a thing as contemporary culture. I think, I think the whole thing is fragmented so much. I've got philosophers here who I'm, I'm slightly scary of saying anything like this in front of Dwayne Williams. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we tend to think that we are dealing with a contemporary culture which is fragmented as opposed to previous cultures which were extremely ordered and so on, and we get involved in narratives about post-modernity and what have you. I don't believe that. I think that, that we've always lived in fractured worlds and that, that, that grand narratives have, have been to some extent illusions. Um, I think contemporary culture is as, it brings it real problems, it brings real challenges, but I think, you know, working with young people as we do here, there's as much richness in them and in their lives and in the expressions they use, even though they're exhausted by it, as there has been in previous generations. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm in by no means willing to dismiss contemporary culture because contemporary culture will be previous culture in not too many years. And we'll be looking back and saying the good old days. I fear, I fear. I'm, I'm quite hopeful. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. As um, to, to, to rather to give the vote of thanks and to bring our evening together to an end, I'm going to invite Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Kenneth Newport. Professor McGrail, you and I have worked together for a very long time, so it is, I think, only right that I take this opportunity to thank you personally, not just for your work and service to the university over many years, but also your personal friendship and your support. It's been a real pleasure to have worked alongside you in theology, philosophy, and religious studies, and have first-hand experience of the way in which you have interacted so positively with both staff and students. Thank you. In your lecture, you covered a range of important and very practical aspects of the interaction between the liturgy of the church and the lives of real people in real communities. In your typically lucid and engaging style, you have guided us along a path lit not only by tight, well-argued theory, but also a wealth of practical experience. The extensive data of which we have had just a few samples this evening bear witness to your lecture's integrity. Via that data and the analysis of it you have conducted, you have taken us onto a journey, a journey out in what you describe as the Lehman. And the Lehman can be a scary place. 
Yes, it is a word used in Latin to mean a doorstep or a threshold, etc. And you've referred to this on a few occasions. But I seem to recall Lehman was also used to describe the cleared ground that lay between the medieval city wall and the edge of the forest beyond. Such territory is inherently unsafe, and sometimes it's scary too. For the inhabitants of the medieval city, or the Roman fortress, the Lehman is ground upon which one is exposed to the possible dangers of invaders or beasts believed to dwell in the forest. There's no cover on the Lehman, and there's no wall to protect you. And for those of us today who rather like the protection of institutional walls, within which we can sit and talk and debate, well away from those realities of what lies out there in the woods, the contemporary Lehman to which you refer remains a disconcerting space. But as our intrepid guide, you have coaxed us onto that ground, encouraging us at least to lean into the Lehman, as you have put it, and thereby to see the reality of what is out there beyond the safe zone. And we have seen how ragged the space can be when we position ourselves between the church's liturgy and its mission. We have seen how uneasily sits the professional theologian's well-crafted accounts of how God, through the liturgy of the church, can, nay, perhaps should, best engage in mission. And we have seen how, as you suggest, clerical solutions and oftentimes mask a reluctance truly to engage with a broader sense of mission and the baptismal priesthood of all the faithful. And for these insights, Professor McGrail, we are grateful. Even those of us, dare I say it, to whom your gentle but clear reminders most particularly apply. I will, however, challenge you on one point. Early on in your lecture, you suggested that Archbishop Derrick would have been mightily unimpressed with your chosen title, Professor of Liturgical Theology. Now, I beg to differ. Being a professor of liturgical theology may well strike some as the very embodiment of it abstraction. From your lecture to us this evening, however, we can see that your professing of liturgical theology is very far from that. Your professing of liturgical theology is rooted in the very real communities that we serve, both as church and as university. Had the Archbishop lived to be with us this evening, I'm confident that he would have recognized that. So thank you for taking us out onto the Lehman and for underscoring the responsibility we have not to resolve but to embrace the ambiguities that are inherent on this ground. And you've done that with confidence. Confidence arising not only from academic authority, though it surely has that, but also grounded in parish ministry and a heart for the people. So welcome, new professor. In fact, let me say welcome, new Reverend Professor, and given that it is Reverend Professor, I will be so bold on this occasion, parson to parson, so to speak, <laughs> as to commend to you some words scribbled down on a scrap of paper by Charles Wesley sometime in the middle of the 18th century. Now, Wesley was a priest in the Church of England. Wesley was a man with a heart for the people. And Wesley was an individual acutely aware of his own calling. He also had a stupendous gift for poetry. Aware of his responsibility to draw together all four of these things, and in a moment of reflection, he jots down, probably in an instant, the following. If well, I know the tuneful art to captivate 
the human heart. The glory, Lord, be thine. A servant of thy perfect will, I here devote my utmost skill to sound thy praise divine. As a priest, as a man of the people, and now as professor of liturgical theology, you will have to replace Charles's tuneful and sound with words more appropriate to your own gifts and to your own professing. But the underlying thought may well be useful. Thank you, Professor Peter McGrail. Thank you for all you have contributed and all you will contribute in your new role. Thank you. Amen, indeed. Um, colleagues, it's been a joy to have you at the university this evening. Um, a great start to our series of inaugural lectures, Professor McGrail, if I may say. Wonderful to have your mom and family with us. That's a special, special joy. And colleagues, um, our next inaugural lecture is on the 8th of December, and our new professor of law, Francesco Rizzuto will be, will be giving his inaugural lecture, so the 8th of December. Put that in your diary. Good night, everyone.